Former President Donald Trump is officially a target in special counsel's investigation into the January 6th insurrection. This is the second time that the special counsel has notified the former president that he is likely to face indictment, this time in connection with the criminal investigation into the events leading up to the Capitol attack. Trump calls the letter a targeted witch hunt. And in more Trump legal news, the Georgia Supreme Court rejects Donald Trump's effort to quash the investigation of the Fulton County District Attorney, Bonnie Willis. With uh, indictment decisions imminent, the Supreme Court of Georgia refused to scuttle an investigation into whether the former president and his allies interfered in the 2020 election. Well, the world swelters in record-breaking heat. Much of the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing wiltering high temperatures, which scientists warn are increasingly likely, and that this hot weather will continue at least through the weekend. An increasingly deep dive among Democrats in Congress about how strongly or even whether to support Israel has reared its head on the eve of a visit by the nation's president to Washington. As progressives openly condemn the Jewish state and others toil to reconcile their backing for the country with disdain for its current government. The rift burst into public view over the weekend when Representative Jayapal, a Washington Democrat who leads the Congressional Progressive Caucus, said at a conference of the liberals uh, that Israel is a, quote, race state, quote, leading to a swift condemnation from House Democratic leaders that prompted her to walk back the comment. Former South African President Nelson Mandela goes from hero to scapegoat as South Africa struggles. Mr. Mandela's image, which the ANC has plastered across the country, has for some shifted from that of hero to scapegoat. Ten years after his death, attitudes have changed. The party Mr. Mandela led after his release from prison, the African National Congress, is in serious danger of losing its outright majority for the first time since he became president in 1994 in the first free election after the fall of apartheid. Corruption, ineptitude, and elitism have tarnished the ANC, according to some experts. On Friday, Iowa's Republican governor signed a strict new abortion ban into law, and for three days, most abortions in Iowa were illegal past six weeks of pregnancy, until Monday afternoon when a district court judge in Polk County said that the new ban would be suspended while the larger legal case against it moved forward. (laughs) Carrie Kennedy, a sister of Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., lambasted her brother in a brief statement yesterday after a report quoted him as saying that COVID-19 was targeted to attack Caucasians and Black people and that Jewish people are most immune. Well, the Michigan Attorney General announced felony charges this afternoon against 16 people in a case involving Trump supporters' attempt to overturn the 2020 election results in the state by convening a false slate of electoral college electors. Each of the 16 defendants has been charged, and one is a former a head of the Michigan Republican Party, with eight felony counts, including forgery and conspiracy to commit forgery for allegedly signing documents attesting falsely that they were Michigan's duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president. You are listening and watching Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop destination for today's trending news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. In this hour, two of my regular superstar contributors are joining me, Dr. Raphael Sunshine, who finally goes by Wraith. He's the executive director of the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation and Dr. Omikanga Dabinga is back. He's a senior lecturer at American University and the author of a new book, The Lies They Tell Black People. And in hour two, today we're going deep on the stories that everyone is talking about. And today that story is about who really benefited from slavery and free slave labor. Now this is in the United States. You know, We all know and 
often hear about and see in movies the depiction of white slave and plantation owners in the South. And some people erroneously believe that they were the only beneficiaries from the U.S. Uh, chattel slavery market. But my guests in today's second hour have both written books and articles and conducted extensive research on who are the real beneficiaries of slavery and their findings will shock you and may make you lose your religion. So make sure you stick around for hour two. But before I bring on my guest, here's what I'm thinking in real time. Democrats, bravo to you because you are putting your money to good use and investing in black voters. Yes, a top ally of the Congressional Black Caucus is launching a new super PAC that will spend tens of millions of dollars to mobilize black voters and try to flip the House majority for Democrats. The goal is to elect the first black speaker of the House. Nakara Campbell Wallace, she's the Congressional Black Caucus's PAC's former political director. She's going to serve as the executive director of this new organization called Rolling Sea Action Fund. Now, this organization will be aligned, but not directly affiliated with the all Democratic Congressional Black Caucus. The group will be organized as a hybrid PAC. Now, this designation will allow Rolling C to both raise money for candidates and have a separate account raising unlimited sums to spend on ads and other election spending. Now, if this PAC is successful, if it is successful in mobilizing Black voters, particularly in some of those difficult uh, congressional districts, districts that went for Republicans in the last midterms, but have the potential of being Democrat uh, or of having Democrats elected, and they are able to flip the House, then House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat from New York and a former member of Congressional Black, the Congressional Black Caucus's leadership, Hakeem Jeffries would become the country's first Black Speaker of the House. This is so important and so incredible. And we always talk about where are Democrats, what are they doing, or are they organizing? You know, what are they doing to mobilize voters? And so I'm always encouraged when I see actions such as this, the forming of a political pact to raise money because just races cost a lot of money and you can't win seats uh, in the U.S. Congress in this country without having a targeted plan, without having a ground game, and without raising a lot of money. And oftentimes the candidate, him or herself, isn't able to raise sufficient funds and they need support from outside entities like this PAC to help it, to run ads. They can, this, a PAC like this can run ads against uh, opponents in certain races. They can run ads that uh, tout the uh, pot potential candidates record. They can run ads about just how great the Democratic uh, Party has done, what the Democratic administration under Biden and Harris uh, has done. And they could be that critical link uh, to provide resources to candidates that may otherwise struggle. Now, this group says it is confident that it will raise and then spend more than $10 million on a multi-pronged strategy in the 2024 election. They're going to spend this money on in-person organizing, so important, engaging key communities. They're going to target those districts that have over 8% Black voting age pop population and again, the most competitive seats in the House. Now, given that Black voters are the cornerstone, continue to be, have been, is the cornerstone of the Democratic Party, and I would say the protector, yes, we are the protector of our democracy. This is clearly money well spent. So bravo to the new PAC Rolling Sea Action Fund, bravo to Nakara Campbell Wallace, uh, and the Congressional Black Caucus for having the foresight to raise money and to invest in Black voter turnout in those key congressional races. 
I think we can do it. I think we can flip the house. And I think we can make Hakeem Jeffries the first African-American speaker of the house. When we come forward, more on today's breaking news with my expert contributors right here on KBLA Talk 1580. Stay with us. We are back and we are tracking today's breaking and trending news. And it has been a day full of breaking news. And I'm so glad I have my regular superstar contributors, Dr. Raphael Sunshine and Dr. Omikongo Dabinga joining me in this hour to help us make sense of this news. Uh, Rafe, I think uh, it was as early as seven or eight o'clock this morning when I started getting alarms about this target letter uh, to Donald Trump, I think he posted about it first, and then it was confirmed that, yes, indeed, he has received a target letter from the special counsel that has been investigating the January 6th insurrection and the events leading up to the insurrection, including the attempts by Trump and allies to overturn the legitimate election of Joe Biden as president. Here we are talking about a 2024 election and still dealing with the fallout of the 2020 election. But uh, what do you make of this news that we knew was coming, but today is the day where Donald Trump uh, has been warned that he is likely to be indicted yet again uh, on federal charges? 
this is the fundamental charge. This is about America's democracy. Uh, there's huge other charges going on around the country, including the security documents and things like that. That's about the security of the country. This is about the security of our democracy. It's been long, long overdue. It's taken a very long time, but this is the way the system works very slowly. But it is got to have him and his allies in Congress have to be particularly worried because it took a lot of people to almost pull off this coup on January 6th. This was not a one man operation. So the big question to me is not who is the target, but who else is going to be uh, brought to account. That is an e maybe an even bigger deal. Yes, uh, just because Trump has received a target letter, and this is a letter that the Department of Justice sends to individuals that are mm -hmm. likely to be indicted. It gives you an opportunity to come in and talk to the uh, prosecuting attorneys to tell them your side of the story to see if you have something that might be exculpatory or something that might uh, you know, exonerate you or in some way cause the uh, indictment not to move forward. Now, we know Donald Trump, uh, Dr. Dominga, is not going to show up. Uh, he's going to just, you know, stay in his little uh, cubbyhole and post on his social media site and make attacks against the special counsel, make attacks against our law enforcement agencies, our judicial system, and just attack, attack, attack. We don't know what charges he might be indicted on, although, uh, Experts are opining that it might be something like obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to defraud, defraud the government. Now, we know that Jerry Kushner was called into the uh, special counsel's uh, office and gave testimony. And one of the questions has to do with what Trump knew during the time that he was engaged in his conduct, uh, what he believed, what his intentions were. And did he really believe he had won <clears throat> the election. I think I saw something where Jared Kushner had testified that he said Donald Trump really thought he won the election. What do you make of that? I think you're on mute, Dr. Dabingo. There have there have definitely been several instances where there have been other people, General Milley, some of his other staff members who have definitely said that he was aware that he lost the election. One aide talked about walking into his office and he said, can you believe that I lost to this effing guy? Uh, Milley was in conversation with him about some potential war plans and, and Trump said something to the effect of, you know, let's let the next guy handle it. And so there have been several instances that have proven that Trump was fully aware that he lost the election. So that's not number one. And number two, you know, as Rafe was talking about, you know, it's, it's long overdue. We can all agree on that. But let's also be mindful of the fact that as I believe the New York Times or USA Today reported a few weeks ago, the, the Justice Department didn't even look at this for about 14 months after January 6th. Like they dragged their feet for over a year. And I believe it was probably the testimony of Cassidy Hutchinson during the January 6th uh, committee hearings that from what I hear really rattled people at the Justice Department. And that's when they started doing the work. They were going after lower level people beforehand. When will Merrick Garland realize that this kind of hands off approach because you don't want to seem political? It is political. So, you know, we're glad that they finally arrived, but it should have happened this time last year or six months ago. And we know that Trump is going to drag this out to try to hopefully get into office or, or use the election as an excuse. But shame on the Justice Department for not doing its job from the beginning. But I am thankful that the January 6th Commission lit the fire under their behinds. I am so glad you said that. I have been saying from day one that Joe Biden made some phenomenal choices uh, when he named his cabinet. And he made what I believe are two really poor choices. And one was Merrick Garland to be the U.S. Attorney General. Judge possibly, maybe, yes, no problem with him being appointed to the appellate court for, you know, in that D.C. appellate court or even for the Supreme Court. But he does not have the, the what I'll call the, the chops or the heart of a prosecutor. He seems yeah. so fearful, so timid, as you said, so afraid to appear, quote unquote, political by definition. Donald Trump is a politician. So That's anything right. you do to Donald Trump, indict him or not indict him, is going to be seen as political by some group of people. And you are not going to ever be able to demonstrate to those hardcore <clears throat> Trump supporters that anything the Department of Justice does, the FBI or any agency does, as it relates to holding Trump accountable, they will never believe it's objective, it's fair. 
because fundamentally they believe Trump is above the law and that he uh, enjoys privileges and rights that no one else in this country enjoy. So That's this right. this notion of hands off only now gets us in this. I think it's even worse because now folks are going to say you're piling on because it looks like rape. This dude is is going to be <laughs> indicted by the special counsel. And this is just on, I mean, there's so many potentials here. The fake electors, right? So engaging in this process, which, you know, is object, uh, uh, obstructing an official proceeding, uh, moving forward with these fraudulent uh, electors. But then remember all the money that he raised on this lie? So you have the potential for mail fraud, uh, you have the potential for, you know, other kind of fraudulent <clears throat> charges related to raising money. Uh, and you also, obviously, something that's about to happen in Georgia at the beginning of August, the end of July. Politically, how is it that Republicans can continue to be the law and order party, a party pretend to be the law and order party and support Donald Trump, who's now likely in the next week, will be thrice indicted <laughs> and two times impeached. Oh, I, I still think he's the likely nominee uh, for president of the uh, on the Republican ticket. I think the Republicans can't live with him and they can't live without him. Uh, they're in a the very anomalous position. Um, I still don't see anybody taking the nomination away from him. Can I put in a good word for Merrick Garland, which I think is largely <laughs> undeserved, <laughs> since I had the same feeling. His appointment of Jack Smith as the special counsel, when I first heard it, I thought my heart just sank. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, God, we're just going to like throw this football off and nothing is going to happen. This guy is unbelievable. Sure. And if they, had put, if they had picked him like two years ago, We'd be two years ahead. And also a good word, as Dr. Dabinga pointed out, let's say a good word about Congress, for God's sake, <clears throat> who we all yeah, enjoy yes. running down. Not since the Senate Watergate hearings has there been a set of hearings that so shook up the justice system that was doing nothing mm -hmm. that they had to take action. Because in this country, Congress can't do it by themselves. All they can do is light a fire under the Justice Department. And they did. They ran some of the best hearings ever. So now we can go back to making fun of Congress. But I mean, I just no, 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 you're right. That's a great point, Rafe. I, I'm <laughs> writing down Benny Thompson. I'm thinking about Liz Cheney. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about some of those uh, superstars of that, uh, those hearings. I mean, it was so well done, uh, laid out in, in clear terms with graphics, great testimony that they were able to take from the depositions that had been taken and Again, the, the Republicans have to be kicking themselves for being so obstinate that they wouldn't wow. allow any of their members yeah. to sit Absolutely. on that committee. And that committee did such an outstanding job, uh, Rafe, as you said, to the point, Dr. Dabinga, that you made originally, that it lit a fire under the Justice Department. It was almost as if, you know, they handed the Justice Department a case like, here, guys, here's the book. Here's the playbook. <laughs> you don't right. have anything to do. Here are the witnesses. We've already deposed them. We already have their admissions. We already have all of their statements. All you have to do uh, is now, you know, put the bow on this package, which you're right, uh, Rafe, uh, this special counsel uh, is really, really going after these cases, uh, obviously not afraid in this recent motion Trump filed to uh, postpone his case involving, you know, misuse of classified documents indefinitely. <laughs> I mean, the special counsel wrote a scathing reply opposition, again, laying out that there are rules set by our courts, uh, their laws that everybody must follow. And the nerve of, of Trump to come in and say, because I'm running for president or because there is a lot of documents, I need this trial to be postponed until basically I die. <laughs> <Which is really, laughs> like, Y'all right. do this trial, you know, at, at my funeral or something, because <laughs> I, I can't participate in it. But I, I hear what you're saying about them sticking, them being the MAGA crowd, sticking with Trump. But John Kasich, uh, Dr. Dabinga was on this morning, one show I was watching, and he said, give the Republicans time. You know, John Kasich, former governor of Ohio, former presidential candidate himself, he thinks that there is some breaks happening in the Republican base. 
and that this this piling on this this cumulative effect is going to cause the party to break with Trump. Do you think Kasich has a point? Uh, no, I don't. To be quite honest, <laughs> I mean, when we watched uh, President Biden's interview with 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 Nicole Wallace a few weeks ago, he he talked about how there were about six Republicans who come up to him and talk about all of their problems with Trump, but they're afraid to go public. So I believe that you have the people like the Mitt Romney's of the world, you know, who are always going to speak up and say certain things. But I believe that these this Republican ba- uh, senators they're too afraid to speak up, and you also got folks in the House who are going crazy down there with everything going on. And Marjorie Taylor Greene and all of these guys, the House is for the most part in lockstep with Donald Trump as it relates to their leadership and Kevin McCarthy. And so McConnell hasn't spoken up, Lindsey Graham. And so even if there are a couple of senators that do speak up, the main leaders aren't going to speak up and say anything. And so really, at the end of the day, I, I, I hear what Kasich is saying, but we can't and we also can't wait for that. And we also have to be mindful of the fact that whether Trump stays the nominee or not, you know, Democrats can't get comfortable in thinking that this is wrapped up because now you got these groups like No Label, you know, looking at Flo and running another candidate, maybe a, a mansion and, and, and Logan, uh, Hogan ticket or something like that. Logan, uh, former governor of, of Maryland, you know, uh, ticket or something like we don't know. You got uh, Cornell West and all these other people out there. There's so many opportunities to have parts of the vote siphoned off by different factions that I know there are a lot of people just praying that these indictments keep coming, but he's not going anywhere. You can run and be indicted. And so people cannot let their guard down thinking that he's going to go away with another indictment because his fundraising numbers just keep rising as well. Well, you're right about that. We definitely can't sit on our laurels. We can't rest on our laurels. We have to be aggressive, which is why I started the show talking about that pack that's going to be engaging black voters. So yeah. important. And yesterday on the show, I had Ro Khan, a congressman from California. He said... He thought a Donald Trump, Tim Scott ticket would be a problem for Democrats because he said Tim Scott is uh, disarming, uh, Mm -hmm. seemed to be a reasonable, sensible Republican, obviously an African-American man. Uh, So you're right. There are lots of ways that the Democrats can lose in 2024. Uh, When we come forward, we're going to talk about Carrie Kennedy blasting her father, her brother, uh, the Michigan attorney general going after those fake electors in Michigan and what is happening with the image and the legacy of former South African president Nelson Mandela. Stay with us right here on KBLA Talk 1580.
I'm back. And in this hour, we are tracking today's breaking and trending news with my superstar contributors, Dr. Raphael Sonnenshine. He's the executive director of the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation and Dr. Omi Kongo Dabinga. He's a senior professional lecturer at American University and the author of a new book called The Lies They Tell Black People. Uh, Dr. Dabinga, how hurtful and just tragic is it to see Nelson Mandela's legacy being uh, destroyed in some ways. And, you know, this headline that he's going from hero to scapegoat as his party, the party that he started, the ANC is being uh, attacked or not, not maybe attacked, maybe called out, uh, you know, allegations of corruption and ineptitude and elitism. Uh, some experts say have tarnished the ANC. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about this? This is, I'm just, uh, I try to contain myself here on this one. Uh, I, I got, it's extremely frustrating the way that people have come out and condemned uh, Nelson Mandela or are starting to. Uh, I, I was just in South Africa in, in March, I believe. I've been there nine times. Um, I grew up, you know, my first activist protests, I can remember when I was like seven or something, was working to free Nelson Mandela and carrying signs. So, you know, I've been very active and involved in the movement. And this is not a man who's never made a mistake. And we can definitely criticize policies and all of that. But here's the thing, Ariva, not only has he been dead for 10 years, but he's been out of office for almost 25 years. So for people to condemn him when there's real leadership now, and there's been real leadership a decade ago and 15 years ago, put your actions and energy and attention towards uh, towards those leaders now. And yes, there are lots of issues with the ANC. And quite honestly, there are some new areas of, of leadership from other parties that are emerging that I, I find myself looking at and being a little bit uh, more supportive of. That's how it works. I mean, when you look at the, the leaders in our civil rights movement, so many of them spent so much time just working to get free. They, they weren't, they, you know, they weren't perfect. They didn't have master plans for everything else after the fact. Sometimes when you're just focusing on just getting free, you may not make the greatest mistake, you know, the best decisions that may happen down the line after you get freedom. Look, freedom is not an event, it's a process. And so my thing is for all of those people who are out there complaining about a, a dead man, I read one article said, well, I wouldn't have worked with the white people, I would have sought revenge. And yeah, you would have been shot. So let's just be honest with that, right? That's just oh, real talk. Help, help, help us out, Dr. Bingo, <sighs> because many people may not know, you know, what's the basis of some of this criticism? You know, you just they're, they're gave basically one example. Saying, they, they're basically saying that, you know, Nelson Mandela should have went on a policy of revenge, revenge politics. He should have basically attacked and taken everything away from white people and in the extreme sense, kicked them out of the country. You know, and so they're, they're upset that they felt like he didn't embrace strong enough policies that would benefit the majority of black people in South Africa because he acquiesced too much to white people to get power. Now, again, there are fair critiques to make about Mandela's policies and what he did. But again, that was his last day in office was 1999. So those guys who are busy complaining about him now, why don't you get out there, focus on running for office? I know people over there who are going to be running for office, who are very popular, who are working to do something about it. If the ANC's time is up, then it's time is up. Make way for new leadership, new younger leadership or whatever. I'm cool with that. But let Mandela rest in peace. That's what I want to ask you. OK, great point. Mandela's out of office for 25 years, dead for 10 years. How come they're not blaming the leadership of the ANC that has been in power for the last 25 years? Because to the extent Mandela may have compromised too much in the eyes of these individuals, what has the leadership done over the last 25 years? Well, I feel like some of these people who are, you know, there are many people who are speaking up against the AMC, but I think some of these other people, they're afraid. You know, they're, they're afraid of retaliation. They're afraid of, you know, way they may get exposed in some way, shape or form. When you got some people, elements of leadership that are corrupt, they can do some real things, you know, in public or, or behind people's back and you don't know what's going on. And so I believe that is a, that is the case. I mean, you look at a place like Rwanda, for example, when I visited Rwanda in 2018, they're calling it the darling of Africa and the heart of Africa. But one thing I noticed when I was walking around that nobody criticized Kagame. Uh, and I was like, wow. And I asked why, and I said, because you will disappear. 
<laughs> like okay. that's what Rwandans told me. And so I feel like there's an element of that, but I also feel like there's a lot of youthful energy that's being misdirected towards the past that they never fully understood rather than focusing attention on the present. And there are many people in South Africa focused on making change in the present now, but those ones who are spending their time condemning Mandela are the ones I take issue with. You want to jump in, Rafe? You have, what are you feeling about this? I mean, it just saddened me to hear because in the U.S., Nelson Mandela was, is, and continues to be such a, you know, an iconic figure. Well, I can't improve on what Dr. Dabinga just said, but I would say this. This is not necessarily about Nelson Mandela. It's about the party. Mm -hmm. And this goes on throughout the whole world. Now, the party is defending itself by linking itself to the heritage of Nelson Mandela. And then so to attack the party, you end up attacking Nelson Mandela. Longstanding parties that have been dominant always run into deterioration. And when that happens, you know, they try to like connect to a previous history that was more popular. This is not an unusual phenomenon, but it's really about the party right now, it seems to me. I also agree that to go back on history and to say he should have been a different person than he was in the time he was in is awfully harsh. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think as somebody who was a freedom fighter and created the beginnings of freedom, it's awfully hard and harsh to go back and say, you could have done this, you could have done that. I mean, he was quite heroic. I mean, I, I think that's yeah, not Yeah, I think people are, are ignoring the, the time mm -hmm. frame in which he yeah. was acting and the circumstances <clears throat> under which he found himself being free from prison and becoming the leader of that country and trying to, as you said, Dr. Dabinga, just, uh, you know, break down the walls of apartheid. So yeah, it's a lot easier to criticize those who, you know, whose actions are, are in the past, but I, I'm with both of you. Let's see what this new, young, energetic, you know, activist class, what can they do to move African uh, folks in South Africa forward? What can they move? How can they move black people in that country forward? Uh, we'll be watching to see because it's easy to criticize, but harder to take action yourself. Speaking of criticizing, Carrie Kennedy, she is lambasting her brother, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., for his weird comment about COVID-19. And then I don't know, both of you probably saw this. He was on Donald Trump's shortlist for possible VP. So I don't know. It's Carrie right to try to get her brother to, to rein it in because he seems to be making a lot of mistakes uh, if his goal is really to be uh, taken seriously as a presidential candidate. What do you think, Rafe? You know the Kennedy family well. You know the legacy. I think I think this is yet another tragedy for the Kennedy family that's experienced numerous tragedies. They know him. They know that he's a troubled person. They know that they have to hear this stuff. And then to hear him taken seriously by yeah. pundits and others is actually worse for the family, I think, because then they have to come in and directly attack their family member who they kind of know where he's at. But then the political press needs people. They need new faces. They need people to liven up the race. So it's not just Biden and Trump. So they have actual serious discussions about his, quote, ideas. And these ideas are like way off off the scale. So I refuse to take him seriously as a political leader. That, that's my that's where I'm taking my stand. He's just saying stuff that just makes no sense whatsoever and is very damaging to his own family, let alone the country. Yeah, it's it's really sad. You're right when you see uh, a family member in crisis because we'd have to admit Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is in crisis and seemingly has been in crisis for a while. Uh, when we come uh, forward, Doctor DeBinga, this Michigan Attorney General announcement should have lots of folks uh, quaking in their boots, wondering if they mm -hmm. might be next. And why are so many otherwise successful people willing to put their freedom, reputation, and entire careers on the line for a man like Donald Trump when we come forward? KBLA Talk 1580.
We are back and we are tracking today's breaking news. There's been lots of it today. Uh, Dr. Omikanga Dabinga is here. He's the author of a new book called Lies About Black People. And Dr. Raphael Sonnenshine is uh, with us. And in this last uh, segment, Dr. Dabinga, why is it that otherwise established, successful people in their, some of these people in their 60s and 70s, why would they put their reputation their freedom, their careers at stake uh, or risk them for Donald Trump. So these fake electors in the state of Michigan, so far the state of Michigan on the same day that we learned that Trump is a target uh, for his actions with respect to trying to overturn the 2020 election, the Michigan attorney general has herself uh, now announced felony charges against 16 Republicans One of them is a former co-chair of the Michigan Republican Party. She's married to a state rep in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another Mm -hmm. one of these individuals is a part of the Republican uh, National uh, Committee. I mean, these are otherwise successful, Mm well-established people. And now they are facing felony charges and their best defense. One of the, the defendants, lawyers said, this is political. And why are you charging my client instead of charging Donald Trump and the lawyers of Donald lawyer, Donald Trump's lawyers who came to Michigan to, you know, sell my client on this scheme? So we already know it's going to be a whole lot of finger pointing going on. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. You know, people, you know what drives people to act crazy, I guess. <laughs> what makes these people risk their lives for this man. I mean, not to mention the non-politicians like the My Pillow guy, who I think is like auctioning auctioning off furniture <laughs> to keep his business afloat. <laughs> yeah. The only the thing I keep coming back to is that I feel like all of these people were so bold in their action because they actually thought they were going to win and be able to get in and do whatever they want. I mean, what would you do if you knew you couldn't lose? If you knew that you were going to, you know, what steps would you go through? And they were all caught up in it. This isn't about we were, oh, we were influenced, we were scared. No, they thought they can grab the power as well and be able to do all the things that Donald Trump talked about doing just last week, you know, suspend the constitution, have the Department of Justice, you know, work to their favor. This is what they want and they got busted, they got caught. And let me also let me also say that this is what happens when you get all Democrats who run a state from top to bottom, like Michigan. So this is another example of why voting matters. So I, I'm looking forward to the accountability that's finally going to happen. These guys are going to snitch on levels that make put rappers to shame. Um, that's for sure. And so, you know, this is definitely one of those popcorn moments. But yeah, this is definitely about they want, they actually thought they could win and they they and they're losing. And now they're going to be held accountable. That's what it comes down to, in my opinion. Yeah, rap songs, a lot of content for rappers, a lot of content for comedians, a lot of content for anyone who is a commentator, because this stuff is really crazy, Rafe. I I hear you, Dr. Binga, but Rafe, what was the basis for thinking they were going to win? There's never been a time in our history where you could create a list of fake electors and say, we vote for this person to be the president, despite the fact that this other person has won the votes that qualify for these folks to be the electors. And then they have to vote, you know, consistent with the way voters in that state have. So were they just suspended from reality? Because there's no precedent for this. So it's not like they can say, well, you know, we got away with this in, uh, you know, 2010. So let's just do it again. <laughs> I think we're going to look back on Donald Trump as kind of a twisted genius in a certain way. I mean, it'll be a pleasure to look back um, and and have that freedom to do. People are going to be getting tenure based on writing (laughs) research studies about this. But so much of it is that he he creates a picture for some people that's much more attractive than reality. And he paints it magnificently. He it's in it's in all sorts of perspectives and it's deep and it has an answer for everything. And one of the answers, as Dr. Dabinga said, is you're going to win and you're going to do whatever you want. Now, this is different, though, from a lot of political movements, including revolutionary movements. People in those movements expect there will be consequences, uh, that they might fail. And those consequences could be dire. To take us back to Nelson Mandela, 
who basically would take the risk of life imprisonment practically or death. There's what's really striking is how surprised people are when they're called in and the judge doesn't roll over as they've been promised. Everyone will roll over. And then they say things like, I had a vacation in the Bahamas. Can I go and have the vacation before, you know, my trial? And the judge looks at them like, what? <laughs> what is this? So what's really striking about this is the notion of no consequences. You're right, and, and because I'm thinking about fabulous. civil rights leaders yeah. and risking their lives. March, they expect to be arrested. Yes. They expect to be, you know, bulldozed by, you know, police officers. They expect physical harm. And they say, I'm willing to risk it all because this is so important. That's right. These that's folks, you're right, here. are scratching their heads and uh, what uh, jail, <laughs> like indictment. And they think by just saying it's political, that's become their buzzwords mm -hmm. that somehow that is going to cause a prosecutor, judge or jury to cut them some slack because, yeah, it's political because you engaged in political conduct. That's, <laughs> right. it's political. And that's why it's so important for Trump to keep saying there will not be consequences. I'll win the election. I'll pardon everybody. I mean, there's this constant repetition. Now, at some point, if that fails, maybe that begins to change some of the dynamics. Since the no consequences piece that, again, Dr. Dabinger raised is exactly right. Uh, that's part of the appeal. Yeah, and we're starting to see this Georgia Supreme Court rejected Trump's effort to quash the investigation. <clears throat> Basically, he wanted to put the put the kibosh on Fonnie Willis's, the DA mm -hmm. in Fulton County, who was investigating him in the same way we this Michigan investigation is moving forward. And these Trump appointed Republican conservative leaning judges, Dr. Dabinga said no, said this investigation, we're not going to meddle in this investigation. And one thing these folks who think they will face no consequences and Donald Trump will pardon them need to know, Donald Trump cannot pardon them for their state That's indictments. Right. He can't do anything with respect to their sentences. He can't commute a state sentence. So if you are indicted, if you are charged in Michigan, Georgia, uh, Arizona, any one of these seven swing states where they were engaged in this fraudulent elector conduct, you will be sitting in a jail cell. You will have your bar license revoked. A lot of these folks are lawyers. Mm -hmm. You will lose jobs. A lot of these folks are losing their jobs and, and they will lose it all. And Donald Trump will not be able to help them. Do you think any of these smart lawyers, business people, Dr. Dabinga gave five minutes of thought to that, that, yeah, he may be able to pardon me if the feds come knocking on my door, mm -hmm. but if my state attorney general indicts me, he can't help me. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think they gave any thought to it. I think that they had power in their eyes and they were just salivating over it. And for people who think that Donald Trump is going to pardon them, I mean, look at, he didn't even pay people's legal fees. I mean, he offered to do that to people who who went out there and fought for him, didn't do that, didn't show up at the rally. Uh, and, and all of these guys who are sitting in jail, finally realizing that he sold them out, these politicians should realize at the same time that he will never do anything for them if he, come, if he was to come back into power. And they need to be mindful because we got this going on in Michigan. And you mentioned Georgia. I mean, finally, Willis is not playing. I mean, she's gone after it. She put teachers in jail. She's going after rappers. Like she is just in the pursuit of justice, period. And so I feel like Lindsey Graham and all of those guys need to be on notice because now that you see that this stuff's hitting the fan, they're going to be dropping like flies waiting to figure out who's going to snitch first. Because I, I feel like some of these guys are, I feel like most of them are not going to jail for Donald Trump. I think you got this now to guy who's probably going to go down with him. But most of these guys at some point, they're going to give in because they don't want to go to prison. And I'm glad that it's finally time that they're going to face these consequences. Well, this Michigan lawyer for one of the 16 uh, who have been charged in Michigan for this fake electoral scheme has said, how come Donald Trump isn't being charged with my <laughs> client? How come those lawyers haven't been charged? And the response from the uh, Michigan attorney general is the investigation is ongoing. Which ongoing. says to me, <laughs> like, just wait and see. There may be other shoes that will drop. Uh, this is, again, mind boggling to me 
Uh, but maybe these folks don't value their career or their freedom in the way that yeah. I value mine. Uh, but uh, we're going to see, uh, obviously, lots more from both uh, Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, and some of these other swing states. Thank you so much. We are out of time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sonenshine. Always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Dr. Dabinga. Again, his book, make sure you check it out. It's called Lies About Black People Everywhere. Books are sold. Uh, and stick with us because we're going to be talking about who really benefited from slavery. And it's not just those white plantation owners in the South uh, that you have seen on television or maybe read about in books. It's going to shock you when you hear what my guests have to say in hour two about who the real beneficiaries of slavery are. Uh, so stay with us right here on KBLA Talk 1580.